Good evening. Hi, welcome back. Yes, sir. This evening's lesson is entitled The Covenant of Christ. The text comes from Romans chapter 8, the first 18 verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, the law of Moses, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, or fleshly minded, the margin says, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But, the spirit of, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with, now not to, but with our spirit, that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, as there's never been a, a time in human history in which man was not without a law or a covenant from God in which he would make known his will. There's just never been a time, even from the foundation of the world. You know, uh, uh, have dominion over the world and, you know, be fruitful and multiply, at the very least. But the patriarchal, initially, the patriarchal system initially, joined by the mosaical, were both taken out of the way in the cross of Christ. Colossians 2 and verse 14, nailed to the cross, Acts 17, 29 through 31, that uh, Christ uh, was risen from the dead, giving us confidence that he's going to resurrect us from the dead, that all men everywhere should repent. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 through 14, he's called us by the gospel. So if anybody is called at all, they're called by the gospel. Now they're called, in essence, they're called by the spirit through the gospel, but it has to be through the gospel that the call comes. They, that's what it says. So, what ought men to know about this covenant of Christ? There is a law, and all men everywhere are amenable to it or subject to it, required to be obedient to it. That if they have any, if anybody has any hope of a of an eternal afterlife that is pleasant, then it'll be through the through the gospel of Christ. So we ought to know that this covenant is the fulfillment of prophecy, that, that it actually predates history. Paul in Ephesians 1, 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. And Peter says, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So God had a scheme of redemption in his mind even before he began construction. He knew what he was going to do. Now, this covenant is touched on introduced, if you will, in a kind of a vague sort of way in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15, where God speaking to the serpent says that he, the seed of woman, notice he says the seed of woman, not seed of man, but the seed of woman, is going to bruise your head, but you're going to bruise his heel. So you're going to get the death blow, and he's just going to bruise himself a little bit. Hebrews chapter 2 says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself Likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. John says, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. 
For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Again, Genesis 3.15. He's going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. So there's, there's the beginning introduction to it, if you will. But Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 31, prophesied uh, the, this new law, that there was a new law coming. And then the writer of Hebrews quotes it almost verbatim in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, and he starts quoting from Jeremiah, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. He's, he's saying that the old law, the law of Moses, is going to be replaced by the new law, by the new covenant. Jesus came, said, I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. So when he fulfilled the covenant, it was take, it, it's like if you go you know, to Lowe's and you order a washer and dryer, a particular model number, a particular serial number, and all the things that, that, that identifies that washer and dryer combination, and then on the day appointed, they show up and deliver it to your house and install it, and you sign the receipt for it, it's not going to be delivered again. It's been delivered. Now, they may show up tomorrow with a whole other set. You know it's been delivered already. We take donations, you understand, but it's not ours. You might need to check that thing one more time. So it's, it's, it was promised, it was prophesied that it would be, uh, that the old law would be done away with, and then the Hebrew writer quotes it and says, it's been fulfilled. And we ought to also understand that this covenant began on Pentecost in Jerusalem, again in fulfillment of prophecy. You know, if you just, somebody, I'm, I'm trying to think of where I read this now. I think Ira Rice was the one I heard quoted. But he said he'd read, and read somewhere where somebody had sat down and figured out that there's three, about 330 distinct prophecies that are fulfilled specifically in the life of Christ. And I was reading a book on apologetics, and the writer was saying that a mathematician sat down and figured out what the odds would be that, that a, a man would fulfill one of those prophecies in, in, specific, in specificity, in very, very specific. And he said he gave, he gave the percentage. And then he said for that man to fulfill two of them very, very specifically. And he gave the, and, and then he said, but, but to do 10 is almost impossible, not to mention 300. So, I mean, the odds, you couldn't, you couldn't get one of the boats to give the odds on that one. <laughs> so it just, they wouldn't even begin that process. The time has been specified. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. And in the days of these kings. Now, Daniel's uh, interpreting the dream of the king. The statue, head of gold, shoulder, so, so forth and so on. And he, and he finishes up with the feet that are made of miry clay and, 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 and iron. And he says... And in the days of these kings, that last kingdom, shall the, God, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, if you look at the prophecy of Daniel, there's actually five kingdoms, I said five kingdoms, five kingdoms prophesied. There's not five, there's five. This five. And the, the last kingdom is a stone cut out of a mountain, that's cut out without hands, and it came down and hit that statue in its feet and destroyed it and, and absorbed all of it. So that's what Daniel's talking about. 
Isaiah chapter 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. And Daniel, in Acts 2 and verse 17, Peter says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord. And he's quoting from, uh, from Joel. And we'll look at that here in a little bit more detail. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, did that happen? Yes, it happened. So when it happened, it was going to happen when? In the last days. So when it happened, it happened in the last days as prophesied, and in the last days the kingdom would be established. So if, the, if, if it was the last days, then the kingdom was established, and so the kingdom was there. Now, um, the place... We've got the time, days of the kings. We've got the place, again, going back to Isaiah chapter 2, um, where in verse, uh, verse 2 he said, the last part of that says, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall, shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. There's the writing on the heart. For out of Zion shall what? Shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, notice Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. This is Jesus speaking just moments before he ascends into heaven. And he's speaking to the apostles. And he said, but ye shall receive power. And we're going to visit this one again too. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the other, other part, uttermost parts of the earth. Now, that's Isaiah chapter 2, 2 through 4. That's what Isaiah said would happen. Jesus said, okay, and by the way, you're going to be the ones to do this. So here you have the Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, prophesying that the word would go forth from Jerusalem. And Jesus is over here, 700 years later, telling them, and you're going to be the carriers of the word that goes out into all the world. Now, if that's not a fulfillment of prophecy, somebody needs to show me it and tell me what it is. So we've got the time, we've got the place. It would come with power. Mark 9 and verse, verse 1, Jesus said, There's some standing here now, right now, that shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom come with power. Now, two, one of two things is the case. Either the kingdom came, or it hasn't, and there's some really, really old people over there in, in Judea right now, waiting on the kingdom to come. Because Jesus said, some of y'all are going to still be alive to see the kingdom come with power. So it came or it didn't. If it hasn't come yet, they're still alive. Or a third possibility, and I'm not in favor of this, Jesus is a liar. Or number four, he was just slapped crazy. And I deny three and four. Three and four is blasphemy. So it came. Now, so did it? Can you prove it? Yes, Strange you should ask that. Luke 24 and 44, Jesus, again, before his ascension, he's meeting with the apostles. And he says, you tarry in Jerusalem to receive the promise of the, uh, of, from, of the Father of power. That they're going to receive power. And you wait there in Jerusalem until you receive the power. Now, either the power came or a bunch of old guys over there waiting. Okay. Now, uh, then you get down to Joel chapter 2 again where it talks about the power being poured out and everybody prophesying and so forth. All right. Um, all right, let's just look at... Um, no, don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, you've got to hold that thought because we're going to come back to it. Calling on the name of the Lord is a very important thing. And, and the prophecy of Joel, chapter 2 and verse 32, that... Peter quotes, by the way, and he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in the Mount of Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, Peter, with the eleven are speaking, in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, and again he's quoting from Joel, what, you know, they saw the, the, in, in Acts 2, 1 through 4, that's when the power came. The Holy Spirit poured out upon these men. They had the sound as, as of a rushing mighty wind. 
They had tongues as of cloven fire resting on the heads of the apostles. And these the apostles were speaking in tongues. Now there wasn't a wind and it wasn't fire, but it was as of. If, 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 if you were standing there, you wouldn't feel any wind blowing you in the face and blowing your hair around. So that's the power. That's when the Holy Spirit came. And I've never studied with anybody that denied that. Everybody agreed, yes, the Holy Spirit was to come with power. And that's what Jesus said in Acts 1 and verse 8. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall receive the power. Well, that happened in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. And that, that got a lot of attention. A sound of a rushing mighty wind, cloven tongues of fire, and people speaking in, in the tongues of those foreign people. Jews that were there. And you can read in Acts chapter 2 all the nations that were represented there. All the different tongues, the different languages that were represented there. And they were saying, how are we hearing these, these Jews speak in our own language? A language. Our own tongue. Not some unintelligible, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, unintelligible jibber-jabber. It was a language. If, if, if my mother-in-law had been there, she was from Paris, France. Spoke French, obviously. She, if she were there listening, she would hear them speaking, one of them, speaking in French. Okay? Because that's a foreign language. That's another tongue. That's the tongue in which she was born. If we were standing there, one of them would be speaking Mississippi. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Y'all? Okay? All right? All right. That's, that's the thing. You got to keep that in mind. So, and then an next, now, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord from First, uh, chapter 2 and 21 of Acts. And Paul in Acts 22, 16 says, Now why tarest thou rise, or not, not tall, but Ananias, Ananias speaking to Paul, Saul of Tarsus, says, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, what's calling on the name of the Lord? Calling on the name of the Lord is being baptized. Um, it's, it's the act of baptism in obedience to Christ's commands. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. Peter in 1 Peter 3, 21 says, The like figure unto baptism doth also now save us, not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Now what's the answer of a clear conscience? I've, been, I've just done what I've been told to do. I've, I, the Holy Spirit testifies with my spirit that I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God. Well, what, how do you know that? Well, I, I heard the gospel. Check. I believe that Jesus was a Christ. Check. I've, um, I've uh, repented of my sins. Check. I have confessed him before men. Check. That I believe he's the Christ, the living God. I've been baptized for remission of my sins. Check. And the Holy Spirit testifies with my spirit. Says, you know, that's right. You did all of that. So, therefore, you are a son of God. That's the answer of a clear conscience. I have done, I haven't earned anything. I haven't put anybody in my debt to give me anything. Luke 17 and verse 10, Jesus himself said, So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. I have performed my duty. I expect the blessings you have promised me. That's calling on the name of the Lord. I've, I, I've done those things. I was baptized for mission of my sins. I did it because you loved me enough to die on the cross for me. That touched my heart that somebody would do that for me. And I want to go to heaven. And of being baptized to contact the blood that sanctifies me and purifies me and purchases me back from the power of darkness, I will do that. That's, a, that's a, not a hard thing to do. Where's the baptismal garments? Where's the water? Let's go. And let's not, let's not wait. We're not going to call anybody. Let's just go do it now. If they, if they were serious, wanted to be here, they'd have been here to watch it happen. Again, this thing is not just, just not that complicated. Whereupon the Lord adds us to the church. The, Jesus said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. Acts 2 and verse 47, we find the Lord adding people to the church. The Lord added to the, people, added to the church daily such as should be saved. So if he built it, and he adds people to it, so somewhere between uh, Matthew 16, 18, and Acts 2, verse 47, that church has been built sufficient to put people in it. Now, now this is just me, but I'm thinking the Lord knows what he built, where it was, and how to put people in that very same thing, and he didn't miss. 
So if you obey from the heart the form of doctrine delivered, Matthew 16, or 6, 16 through 18, then you become a, son of, a servant of righteousness, and the Lord has added you to his church. You don't need any other church. It's not your church. It's not my church. I don't have a church. People have asked me, well, what, what's your church? I don't have one. Well, who do you preach for? Same folks Paul did. <laughs> I, don't give, I don't give it to them. I make them work for them. What do you mean by that, preacher? I preach for Christians. Well, what kind of Christians? Pretty faithful Christians. I don't, I don't give it to them. I make them work for it. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean those that have obeyed the gospel. They did what Jesus said to do. They were led by the Spirit to do the things the gospel said to do. That's who I preach for. By the way, I want you to be one of those folks too. So, so what happens when the obedient, penitent heart submits to the will of God? When, you, when somebody, when those folks there in Acts chapter 2, they've been listing all that crowd, and we don't know how many they were. I've heard as much as 500,000 more were there in the temple on that day. I, I have no idea. I don't know how you'd know that, but somebody somewhere said, well, I think there's 500,000. Okay, let's just say 250. Let's not be crazy about it. All right. However many of the words there, they're listening to these men speak. And Peter says that all the house of Israel know assuredly that you have murdered with evil hands the Son of God. That God has made this Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and, and Savior. What shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? What's the solution to this? When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? I would understand them being bothered. You just murdered the Messiah. That, that fellow you've been waiting for all these years. You murdered him about 50 days ago. Holy. I mean, just think about that. What do we do about that? Well, and Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one, of you, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sins. So, what happens when this obedient, penitent heart submits to the will of God? It changes from a mind concerned with the carnal, this exterior world out here, and it's an important thing, no, not take anything away from it, to one concerned more with the spiritual. Again, going back to our text, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 9. The carnal mind that those folks in Jerusalem were were pricked in their hearts and some of those folks with carnal minds that had murdered the Messiah, that ignored the miraculous, that ignored and denied that he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub, they said. Well, you can't get much more carnal than that, can you? What would they have done to have been more carnal? Well, they murdered him. Yeah, that would even trump denying that Jesus did it by the power of the Holy Spirit instead of by the power of Beelzebub. So were these folks carnal-minded? I mean. But yet, when they heard the truth, they were pricked in their hearts. Well, what are you going to do about this? Repent and be baptized. With many other words, he exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from sin toward generation. And those that gladly received the word, those formerly carnal minds that are now taken on the idea of the spiritual, obeyed the gospel. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's a tremendous thing. Look over, notice Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse, uh, verses 1 through 3. I think we, I think we used, it, used that this morning. Of course, I took my bookmark out. He says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You were carnally minded. You were these people that didn't care a thing about the spiritual stuff in life. You were the ones that were the carnally minded that Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through. That's who you were. But you were quickened. He quickened you. Where in a time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all, we all were carnally minded. We all had our conversation times past and lusts of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That we were those carnally minded people. But when we heard the truth, we were pricked in our hearts, and we said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, this new mind, this new changed mind, focuses on the heavenly. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. They now realize there's something more to this life than just getting up every morning and going to work and do, or doing whatever it is you do. 
There's more to it than that. And, and we're not strictly concerned with the worldly stuff in this life. Now, obviously, we live here and we have to deal with it, but it's not our main concern. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, there's not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In other words, you were carnally minded, and you're not now. So we need to, might, might need to change our behavior. Look over chapter 3, if you've got your Bibles open. John chapter 3, verse 18. He said, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So that's the do that matters. It's to do. And hereby we do know, and hereby know, hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. So God knows what's in our heart. Even though we are guilty, we reckon, how could God forgive me? I don't see how he could forgive all that stuff I did. Well, because he's God, that's how. And he said he would, that's why. So what we have to do, and this is the tough part, is we have to trust him to do what he said he's going to do. Even though we know who we are. Well, he does too. It seeks the heavenly home. Again, you know, you have to get up in the morning. You have to get your clothes on. You have to go to work. You have to earn a living. There's stuff you have to do. You can't just sit. I mean, you might be retired. I, I get that too. But, but the rest of us have to get up and go to work. You know, we've, we, have, we have things that we have to earn a living. We have to put groceries on the table we've got to keep the lights on the air conditioner we got there's stuff we have to do but that's not all there is to our lives we now recognize there's something more and more important that it's the heavenly home we're looking for hebrews chapter 11 and, and verse verse 16 he says but now they desire a better country that is heavenly wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he hath prepared for them a city 12 and 22, he says, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. In chapter 13, 14 of Hebrews, he says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So we recognize that this place is not our final, ultimate home. That there's something beyond this. Listen, I don't mind living here. I, I don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not whining about living here. I like it miss my wife, but I like this place. I like living here. And the fact that there's going to be a city where we're all going to be reunited once again is tremendous. I mentioned this morning uh, when uh, Sister Skelton died a while back and this place was packed and the song service was led. Boy, that was tremendous. That was just tremendous. And everybody said, boy, it'd be nice to come home. I said, well, come on back. Well, I can't do that. Well, then just never mind. <laughs> what would you bring it up for? <laughs> Man. Uh, but the life then led becomes one characterized by righteousness. And this is the really, really crucial part of this. And, and I got ahead of myself a little while ago. For, I should have read 1 John 1, 7 through 9 first, but I didn't. But 1 John 1, 7 through 9 talks about the life that we live. He said, but if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. Walking in the light. There's, there's, the, there's the characteristic life of the faithful, righteous child of God. If we say we have no sin, we who walk in the light. We deceive ourselves, truth is not in us. If we confess our sins as righteous individuals, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, that goes back to the blood of Jesus washing us from our sins. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. And then, then we'd get over to first, or, uh, chapter 3, verse 18 through 20, <coughs> that there's the idea of us walking in the light as he is in the light. We're more sensitive about sin. So when we commit that sin, it, it, we're more sensitive about sin, and we're, we're more ashamed of having committed that sin. We might have been previously, because we should know better. You ever had one of your kids, why'd you, I've already told you don't do that. And you did it again. Okay, here we are. We're walking along, going about our daily business. We recognize we've sinned. Whew. How can he forgive me of this again? Well, because he's God and you repent and he's promised to forgive you. 
because he knows our heart. He's bigger than our heart. If our life is characteristic by walking in the light as he is in the light, he's righteous and just to forgive our sins when we ask for his forgiveness. Didn't, didn't Peter say, Lord, should I give somebody seven times in a day? What did the Lord say? Seven times 70. That's 490 times. Yeah, that's tremendous. He's not saying go sin 490 times either. That's not his point. He's saying that you forgive the penitent heart if it takes 40, 490 times in a day, then that's what you do. But why would they do that? Because they're flesh. They're flesh, that's why. And they're struggling, with, with, and they're struggling in the flesh with the flesh. Christ's covenant has been delivered. The faith once for all delivered to the saints, Jude says. It can be understood. Paul told the Ephesian brethren, when you read what I wrote afore in a few words, you'll have my understanding. So I'll know what Paul knew. That's a tremendous thing. And, it will, and that word is going to judge us at the last day, John 12, John 12 and verse 48. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. So the fact is, I know what the standard of judgment is. I know what the Lord expects of me. I know how sin is forgiven. I know how to avoid sin by reading and studying the word of God, study to show thyself approved unto God. So I know that. I can know what it is I'm supposed to do. And there won't really be any surprises for, the, for, for those that are children of God. There won't be any surprises on the day of judgment. Maybe shock, but not surprises because it's there. Our eternal destiny will be determined by how we lived our lives. Read the scene of the judgment scene in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through following. And there were people that went about doing good. And the Lord said, come to the rest prepared because you fed, you fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was sick. Came to visit me in prison. Lord, when did we do this? When you did it at least to my brethren. Well, I just fed the hungry. I just clothed the naked. I just visited the sick. I, and that, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do, but when you did that, you did it at least to my brethren. There's a bunch of folks going to say, depart from me, never knew you. Well, Lord, because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't. When did we see you? When you did it not to the least of my brethren. It's a very big deal. Acts chapter 10, and Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So go back and look at that idea of taking care of folks, the benevolence that we are supposed to engage in. <coughs> but in every nation, he that worked, feareth him and worked righteousness. Revelation chapter 20, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10, destroyed with great heat. And there was found no place for them, the earth and the heaven. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. The books, the books of our lives were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And if your name's not written in the book of life, basically the citizenship book roster for the city of heaven, city of God in heaven, the New Jerusalem, then, then if your name's, name's not written there, you're going to hear depart from me, I never knew you. That's going to be a sad day. There's a sad day coming. We sing that hymn also. There's a sad day coming. So our task is to, to prepare ourselves. Our task is to be the kind of people that God's going to be honored by. And the thing is, is we can know what that is. We can know what it is we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, and when it's supposed to be done. Now, there's, there might be some things you're, you're kind of stuck on, and that's what we're here for is to help one another. So if there are questions, I mean, if there are some things you're not sure about, let's, let's talk about those. I mean, I, let me know. I'll preach a sermon on it. I, I'm always looking for an idea. So if you've got a question, let me know, and I'll, I'll deal with it from the pulpit if you want. Otherwise, we'll sit and study it across your dining room table. But this, the gospel plan is very specific. Hearing, Jesus said, they shall all be taught of God, John 6, 44 and 45. Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So I have to believe what the Bible teaches about Jesus as the Bible teaches it about Jesus. I have to be willing in Luke 13, 3 to confess my sins, except you uh, rep or repent of my sins, except you repent. You shall likewise perish. Confess him before men. Tell you next, except you confess me before men, I will not confess you before my heavenly father. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. 
Baptized for mission of sins, Mark 16, 16. Living that faithful Christian life, Revelation 2 and verse 10, being faithful unto death. You know, that's, that's, how, that's how we acquire the confident expectation of the blessings of heaven, Colossians 1 and verse 5. If you're not a child of God, become one. If you are, but you've been unfaithful, come back. If there's questions, let's, let's study, open our Bibles and study together. Prayer, let's pray together. No greater blessing than folks praying for each other. And when you mention my name, I wouldn't be insulted in the least, trust me. So if you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come down front and let us know. All together we stand and sing.